Okay, I just want to spend a little bit of time talking to you about uh, image processing uh, because it's it's an interesting subject. I think our textbook does a good job of talking about it, but I, I, I want to make sure that we understand each step of how, like, for example, histogram analysis occurs. It, it, I know that sounds like a fancy uh, technical term, but it's a fairly simple thing to understand. And, for example, if we, if we just look at this slide right here, you can see that um, something about the way this app that I'm using here has mis misunderstood the image that I gave it because it's created all this dead space here at the bottom. Um, so it, it has misunderstood or misregistered the information. So we'll talk about how that, the same thing can happen with our digital images for x-ray, in x-ray tech technology. So I want to talk about how some of these things occur and, and how we can maybe avoid them for diagnostic imaging. So here's some objectives. Uh, we'll, we'll discuss about uh, field exposure field recognition and potential errors, which, which is essentially the problem that happened here with these slides, is that it misunderstood the fields between these different PowerPoint slides. Um, then we'll identify steps of the histogram formation. Our textbook, again, breaks this down into discrete steps, but I want to make sure that we're real clear on, on how, these, uh, how these things are uh, analyzed and, and, and formed. And then finally, we'll talk about errors that might be associated with automatic rescaling. And that kind of gives us a way to segue into the next chapter and to think some towards uh, digital post-processing. So the rescaling, um, basically, um, occurs because, uh, uh, for example, a, a CR PSP plate reader will scan the entire uh, phosphor plate and it's going to read both the exposed and unexposed areas and when the PSP reader fails to recognize an exposure field border um, the image quality will be reduced. So poor collimation and poor alignment can be a factor in this. Um, also, like shooting multiple exposures on a single CR plate can lead to this an error like this where it has rescaled inappropriately and created an image that's unreadable. Um, the same is true for um, flat panel detectors like digital radiography detectors, um, but the analysis involves looking at a uniform termination of the exposure field, so the differences between values found in adjacent DELs um, or detective elements. Um, unlike the uh, computer radiography field recognition stuff, the computer's only going to analyze the exposed areas inside the collimation. So, um, exposure level controls the number of electrons collected, basically, and edges are recognized as collimation borders when the differences between the, the DELs indicates a well-defined boundary on the image receptor. What all that means is this is more of a error associated with computed radiography than with digital radiography or, or direct radiography. We, we would expect to see less of this kind of rescaling error. So let's talk a little bit about how the histogram is actually formed. These digital images um, consist of ranges of data values from like low to high exposures, depending on the technique and the subject factors of whatever we're x-raying. Um, and the histogram is going to graphically represent a collection of exposure values extracted from the receptor. So each one of these uh, little lines here uh, along the y-axis represent an amount of pixels at that exposure value. Um, so the x-axis indicates the receptor exposure amount, and the y-axis indicates the number of pixels for each exposure. And the ADC must convert or quantize the continuous stream of electrons into unique digital values. So again, as long as it's receiving a signal, it's going to be quantizing that into a histogram, into various histogram values. So as, as long as we've got that x-ray button on, it will continue to form a histogram. And we would expect that histogram to look identical um, with other like the other body parts, right? So, for example, a hand x-ray is a hand x-ray is a hand x-ray, same with the histograms. A hand histogram looks a lot like uh, someone else's hand histogram. So these patterns are, are unique for each uh, atomic part. Um, the, a hit, when a histogram has a higher sampling frequency, these bars are just going to be packed more closely together, and it will be able to extract more unique data points. Um, and then during image processing, the resulting histogram is a value distribution of the quantized data. So I, I want to say all that to say the, the big thing to pull out of this is that patterns or values of histograms vary for each anatomic part. And... 
During data acquisition, the histogram is the value distribution of the quantized data. Now, I've represented it here graphically just for us to understand it better. Just understand the computer's not looking at a graphic, it's looking at a table, and that's the way it, it actually thinks about this data. So let's talk about how the computer then analyzes these histograms to give us uh, images. Um, so there's two basic f formats that we would talk about for that. One is a priori. And with a priori um, histogram analysis, there's, there's three basic types. And it always relates to what the low value is and what the high value is that this histogram is going to, that this computer is going to recognize. So for example, here, here's type one. I'll just call it T1 here for the sake of brevity. And at the one, at the low side of the histogram, uh, like the really, really brightest part of the image, we're going to say that's going to be bone. And then for the, rather than sampling the darkest part of the image right out here, which might be air like surrounding the patient, we're going to say the skin line is going to be the other boundary. And so everything between these two boundaries we're going to call our region of interest or sometimes our volume of interest. Um, and these are the values that will be used to construct the, the data for the x-ray image. That's, again, um, type 2. It requires two specific values. The first represents the greatest attenuator, which in this case is bone. The second signifies a minimal value on the histogram, so like a skin value. And then the values of interest occur between these two values. So pretty basic concept is that it's just, it's just analyzing this data to say, okay, that's bone, that's skin, everything between the bone and the skin is what I'm interested in. Now, sometimes that can vary with certain body parts, and so we might have an area of maximum attenuation and, and, and maximum value, right? Um, and those would be cases like, for example, torso, spine, or pelvic examination. And so a type 2 histogram analysis of the a priori type um, displays values of interest from the maximum attenuator up to the maximum value of the main histogram. Um, so why would we do this? Well, we do this with anatomy that does not have a tremendous amount of, um, of contrast uh, inherent in it. Like, for example, a pelvis is just a, is just a pelvic bone. Uh, a, a spine is just a spine bone. A skull is just a skull bone. And so <clears throat> we, we're just interested in volumes of, volumes of interest that are bony volumes of interest. Now, the last one, T3, is where things maybe get a little bit complicated. But this is very helpful in that it takes into account an, a significant attenuating object such as uh, something metal or even barium um, within the x-ray image and tries to account for that without um, changing the image values too much. So, if, so for example, it's going to set a, a, a value that that gets rid of certain, like the barium or the prosthetic hip, for example. So anything um, beyond, beyond this volume minimum, um, it's going to exclude. And anything above this, it's going to exclude. So this, for example, over here would be the barium. And it's saying, no, I'm not interested in that. I'm just interested in this here. And so the computer recognizes that that's barium or that's, for example, a prosthetic hip, and it makes um, accommodations for that as it's looking at the volume of interest. Now let's look at um, neural histogram analysis, and th this is a little bit more uh, complicated, and I'm not going to get down into the real nitty-gritty of this, but just understand that the data that's extracted from the plate, it's compared to two or more predefined histograms, and then the image is created after extracting image data is matched to one of the two predefined histograms. So this does involve some artificial intelligence, and that's why we call it neural histogram analysis. We just need to understand that, for example, when we feed an image into it, it's going to search that against other, like it'll say, no, it looks like this, doesn't look so much like this, of these two I'm going to go with this. Um, so the computer stores appropriate histograms for each body part and then the analysis compares the minimum and maximum values in the image. Um, and then this is uh, standardized further and, and stored and its pixel values are further kind of learns through that process. So the process of matching the captured image values to standardized value is often called uh, automatic rescaling. So I'm going to move along. And this is kind of our last concept here. Basically, in summary, if we were to summarize what we're talking about with histogram, each anatomic part generates different histograms. The computer can store histograms for each part. It, it might just uh, do that in bulk or it might um, 
it might have very specific histograms that it that it is networking with, like in a neural case. And then analysis is going to compare a minimum and maximum value, and these are pixel values for the type of exam. Um, if the captured values don't match the standardized va values, then they are automatically rescaled. Um, and so I'm segueing here a little bit into digital post-processing, but this will help us it, to kind of understand, okay, histogram analysis, and then it very quickly, the computer very quickly moves. Once it has its histogram locked in, it, it, it's going to move right into automatically rescaling that. So for automatic rescaling, the values of interest are predetermined, and then the automatic rescaling makes the data output and image display consistent even when there are errors, for example, in exposure technique. Um, so in essence, rescaling can create an acceptable image despite overexposure. And the technologist then has no visual cue that an overexposure occurred. This, of course, is what we're talking about when we talk about dose creep. Automatic rescaling is kind of the, the number one culprit. I'm, I don't want to uh, make automatic rescaling sound like a bad thing. It's actually really, really helpful to have the computer rescale our images for us, but we need to understand that it's doing that and that there's no visual feedback to determine whether or not um, we used an appropriate technique for an image. And that dose creep is, of course, the potential to gradually increase patient ex radiation exposure over time due to that lack of visual feedback from digital images. So technologists, as technologists, we are responsible for maintaining standards of that limit patient exposure, and we need to look for sources other than the displayed image to detect dose creep. What the computer does, on the other hand, is it uses a lookup table to do its automatic rescaling. And this may look kind of familiar to us from like Bouchong chapter 10, right? But what we have here is an, is an H and D curve. And so when the computer initially gets the data, um, it, it, it would initially um, demonstrate just a flat line, right? Of, um, of exposure values. Um, but what it's going to do is it's going to automatically rescale that and actually generate um, a contrast curve. It's going, to, it's going to use a lookup table to change the numbers around a little bit until we get appropriate contrast in our image. So automatic rescaling of the histogram compensates for overexposure and underexposure, and then contrast is set by using this lookup table. We'll talk more about lookup tables here in the future. Here are my references for this uh, video. Um, I'm really interested to hear what y'all think about it. I've really appreciated hearing um, from you on the Ratitudes, and hopefully um, you're enjoying this information. I think it's a really interesting area of study.